Welcome to My Life Chassidus Applied, episode 296. This program is dedicated by Gary Salvat in loving memory of David Arn ben Yosef Yeshua HaKoyen. Well, we're about to enter Chav Bey Shvat. This will be the 32nd yard site of the Rebbe Tzanchaya Mushke, Chav Bey Shvat, Tovshin Memches. And now we're in Tovshin Pei. We're also coming from the days of Yud Shvat, when we began the 70th year of the Rebbe's leadership from Tovshin Yud. So in the coming programs during this entire year, and hopefully Mashiach will be here very shortly, even before the year is over, immediately, we'll be dedicating an extra emphasis on applying chassidus to our lives to honor and celebrate the 70 years of the Rebbe's leadership, which is all driven by the mission of the Deir Ashvi, the seventh generation, Laham Shechina, to bring down the divine presence, Lamata Mamash, literally below, to see the divine in everything we do, to do everything we can, Tut can do everything in your power to bring the Gula. And your Futsa spreading, disseminating, distributing the wellsprings outward to the farthest outskirts. Chutzah is our mission, as the Mashiach told the Baal Shem Tov, that that's when Mashiach will come. So in a program called Chassidus Applied, this is exactly its objective, is to demonstrate and to actualize the application of Teter Sech Siddis, Mayanus Secha, your wellsprings, the Baal Shem Tov's wellsprings, Primis HaTeter, as elucidated and explained and developed by the Rabbeim afterwards, after him, the Magid, and then the Alta Rebbe through Siddis Chabad, and the sixth generation, to the Rebbe, the seventh generation. So honoring the 70 years of the Rebbe's leadership, we have to increase, heighten, the volume, both in quantity and quality, in doing exactly that, applying chassidus to our lives. So one of the ways we've been doing it is the contest, which is now in its last 10 days. There's 10 days left with a chance to win $10,000 first prize, $3,600 second prize, $1,000 third prize, as well as a $500 student prize, and this year another $1,000 prize for a creative artistic work applying chassidus to a contemporary issue or challenge, whether it's in the form of an essay or it's in the form of another creative and artistic presentation. All the guidelines and all the details are at chassidusapplied.com slash contest. So let us now go, since Chav Shfat is literally the beginning of this week, let's talk about that, the Rebetz. Now, the Rebbe's is somewhat of a paradox. The paradox is that on one hand, it's extremely private. Very few people had met the Rebbe and very few people had spoken with her. She was very discreet. Though the Rebbe was so prominent in leading, the Rebbe was in direct, in direct disproportion to that, completely private. And here and there, we had a story, an anecdote, and so on. And yet now, at Chav Shvat, 32 years ago, She's the Stalkus of the Rebbe. And the Rebbe honored her by speaking about her, both during after the Shiva and during the year, the entire year dedicated to the living shall take to heart, make it very clear that he wants us to learn from her, to be inspired by this date, to increase in all matters of Yiddishkeit, the Rebbe instituted the Mifzi Yem HaLedes and her birthday, Chofei Oder, that year. Her birthday is the 25th of Oder, which is also, according to one opinion, the birthday of the world. And, um, and as such, that was one thing that became a very clearly identifiable Mifzi campaign in connection to the Rebbe. And the Rebbe established a Keren Chomish, which is a particular foundation, charitable foundation, and other different directives that we learned throughout that year. And over the years, in her honor. So in a way, suddenly Chav Be'i Shvat brought her to prominence, became a formal day. To the point that, this, that these days, uh, every year since then, the Kinnus HaShluchis, the International Conference of the Women Shluchis, emissaries of the Rebbe, gather this period of time as well. 
and more and more. So the explanation is very obvious. Ein melech b'lei matrin, he says the words that the Tzemach Tzedek said when the Rebbe Tzachayim Mushke was nostalgic, but Tzemach Tzedek, same name of the Rebbe and the Tzemach Tzedek, the same name the Rebbe has, he said those words, Ein melech b'lei matrin, a king is not a king without a queen. Chassidus explains it, Zah and Malchus, that you need them both together, king and queen. It's not just a technicality or formality, it's actually two halves of one whole. The fact that we did not see or it wasn't obvious to most of us. The connection doesn't mean there was no connection. In Tovshin Yudalit, in the 25th year of the Rebbe's anniversary, the Rebbe said, Does the mit This is the day that bound us together because, very practical level, by marrying the Rebbetzin, the Rebbe became son in law of the Friedrich Rebbe, which continued that Shalshalas, that chain. But it's more than just the technicality, it means that the Rebbe, the Rebbe's leadership, is connected through the Rebbe's. So it doesn't matter whether we see it or not. As a matter of fact, according to Chassidus, Malchus is actually invisible. Less law, Mirga Malchum. Malchus, the expression in Zayar is, it has nothing of its own. Compared to, the moon is compared to Malchus. The moon has no light of its own. All of its light is reflecting the light of the sun. And yet it has even more than the sun, Chassidus explains. As we look at the moon, you see it's not just a mirror image of the sun. It has its own pale, its own mystique. And if you didn't know, you'd think it's the light of the moon. Because the moon has its own way as being Malchus. It, part, it channels the light of Zah. Zah is the Midas. That's called the masculine um, archetype. And Malchus is the feminine. That together, they join together and you have a full entity. And it's Malchus that gives birth to Bia, to Bri Yitzir Asir, to the next generation. Both literally and also spiritually. So though Malchus on its own is invisible, and the Rebetzin personified that. She was one of the most invisible people that we would know, of a, a wife and a daughter of a Rebbe, and yet very little known, literally like Malchus, like the moon. And yet in that relies tremendous glory. Kfud the Basmelech Pnima. The glory of the princess is Pnima, is internal, within. In the deeper Maimorim of Chassidus, I mean, all Maimorim are deep, but some of the deeper concepts, it talks about two types of energy that flows from the divine. Two tracks. One is expressive energy. Eudelegales. Es atzmei. Le'elimis. The light and the energy, vitality that shines and vivifies and relates to existence. An eudelegales la'atzmei. An eud that is only an intimate energy that just expressing that internal place, that internal experience. It's still an expression, but it's an invisible expression. And that's the root of these two expressive energies. One is the mashpia, the transmitter, and the other is the recipient. But recipient doesn't mean just a passive keli, receptacle. In its passivity, in its non-expression, it expresses even more like the student, the teacher, the great teacher in the Talmud that says, who do I learn? I learn much from my teachers. I learn even more from my chaveri, my colleagues. And above all, from my students I learned most. Because the Eir Chazer that comes from Malchus, that refractive energy, it's not just reflective. There's a power that that reaches into the core, that way Malchus reaches into Keser, as Chassidus explains. In most of the Rabbeim, the Rebetzins were not as prominent perhaps, but they were known, they were met people and so on. So I've never seen this literally stated, but no way the Rebetzin personified and manifested Malchus in its epitome. The Rebbe, of course, is also Malchus, Deir Ashvi. So whether we understand it or we relate or we so it's revealed, there was a joint union, and you could see the impact on that Chav Beishvat 32 years ago, and we honor that. And perhaps it becomes revealed, that which is concealed, when you see it missing in a physical sense. And we saw the Rebbe's anguish, if we can call it that, but Das Tachten. We saw literally how the Rebbe grieved openly, uncharacteristically, and it was not because that it was out of control, God forbid, it was because that's part of the experience. A melech blei matranisa. Now, does that mean the melech is not a melech? God forbid, he remains a melech. But there's a, an effect. They tell the story with Semach Tzedek. So the Semach Tzedek, like the Rebbe, the Rebbe was nostalgic before the Rebbe. So uh, the other Rebbeim, it was the other way around. The Rebbeim outlived their Rebbe's. Uh, I'm sorry, the Rebetzins outlived the Rabbein. 
Um, we're talking about Begashmis, obviously. So there's a story they tell, I heard it many years ago from al Chassidim, that um, when the Tzamech Tzadik, when it was Tafresh Chof Aleph, five years before they talked of the Tzamech Tzadik, when the Rebbe Tzachayim Mushka, so Tafresh Chof Aleph would be in 19, 18, uh, 1861. So the Rebbe, Rebbe Tzamech Tzadik went into a certain seclusion, lack of a better word. Seclusion, there was no Yechidas, there was no Maimorim, no answers. It was a certain um, withdrawal, if you wish. And uh, the Chassidim, of course, was trying to in some way revive the Tzemach Tzedek's will and power and passion. And there's expressions that they told the Tzemach Tzedek. The Tzemach Tzedek said, Ein melech matranisa, king without a queen. Something missing. And they responded, the Matranisa, the queen, Tayr is also called a Malka, a queen. The Tzemach Tzedek Fert was not uh, consoled. It was a while, I don't know how long it was, but then no, notice came that the Ratzamach Tzad is going to say a Maimir Chassidus. The first Maimir after that is Talkus. Tofresh Chafal. So you can imagine the Simcha, the joy by Chassidim. They came together, waiting for the Maimir. They came to Lubavitch. Rabbi Hill Paracha, who was then already an older Chassid, he, um, he would pass away in Tofresh Chaf uh, Gimel. Yur um, uh, of. So he came from Paritch, though he wasn't well, but the Maimir by him was the most precious possible thing. So he came. Chassidim were waiting. Chassidim is in his room. Some time passes, more time passes, nothing. Chassidim remained. Rabbi Hill had to go out. He wasn't feeling well. He had to go out. He goes out of Natachna, wherever they were. And he hears two young light, two young Chassidim, talking to each other, whispering to each other. And he hears something he really was very disturbed by. One chassid said to the other, something a little not respectful about the Tzemach Tzedek. If I stay, something like Tzemach Tzedek isn't, uh, I'm not sure what word it was used, but it was not respectful. Depressed or uh, sad or whatever the word was. So he suddenly got a new surge of energy, as, as he may have been. He went over to them and said to them, Shvenselach, Shvenselach, Shvenselach. I'll let you translate that. You can translate it more bluntly, less bluntly, but it basically means idiots, 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 if not worse. It says, Vos meintir. What do you think? A Rebbe is Eisen, Egen, a nose mit His eyes, a nose, and a mouth. I think that's what a Rebbe is. A Rebbe is a lakus. A Rebbe is godliness. And when there's a concealment on godliness, there's a concealment on the Rebbe. Think of these words. It's a very different take. We're not humanizing. We're not going to dismiss. We're not going to talk about the language that's not respectful. Shechinta begalusa. Yeah, the Shechina itself. Chol tzarasam leitzar. The Shechina itself goes into galus with us. Chassidus explains why. To give us the strength. To, keep, to give us the spark so we can prevail and endure. But the Shekhinah goes into Golis, and it says that when the Sein Yisrael, the enemies of Israel, Me'ikim, they torture Israel, Me'ikim HaShekhinah, they're torturing the Shekhinah. How could you say torture? Because godliness is affected, Chavyochel, so to speak. But it's because it's godliness that it's, relates to us, so when something happens to, the, to Elikus, there's a concealment, there's a concealment on the Rebbe. We saw that as well in, in Tov Shemem Ches, even with physical eyes, you saw, you saw effect. I'm not going to analyze and explain, but it was an effect. The Rebbe, of course, remains a melech. A melech doesn't go away. But you could see from this story when the Rebbe asked Rabbi Pekarski, the Rav, halachadik a question, that when a uh, wife passes away, is there still a connection between the son-in-law and his father-in-law? The Rebbe was, of course, referring to the Friedrich Rebbe himself. And Rabbi Pekarski wisely and, and, and immediately answered, absolutely, what's the question? But the, even the question that Rabbi asked tells you what kind of helm it was. And of course the answer was correct, that Rabbi remains a Rabbi, remains a Rabbi right now. A Rabbi is a Rabbi. Yazib Marise does not forsake his flock. Mazari Bachaim, Afu Bachaim, all the explanations, Yaakov Leimes, I mean, go on and on. But still, to say that it completely no impact, no, there's an impact. 
Because in Ruchnius and in Gashmius, on all levels, Melech HaMatanis, a king and queen. That's why Chav Shvat is relevant to us. So what does the Rebetzin, role of the Rebetzin play in our lives? You could very well say that perhaps before Tashem Ches, maybe it played a role, but not in a more invisible way. Some people had a relationship with the Rebetzin. The Rebetzin, through the Rebbe, had a relationship with us. But after Chav Shvat, it clearly manifests itself in the Yemelad, as I mentioned, and all the other commitments we make in the spirit of the Rebetzin as being part of what the Rebbe is. So, regarding questions that were asked, a number of questions that came in about Chav Beishvat, I'm now going to address them, but I already gave the introduction, which I believe will set the tone and set the stage for addressing all these questions and more. Beginning, what role does the Rebbe play in our lives? Today, her role plays, as the Rebbe said right after the Shiva, when he stood up and he edited it afterwards, I had the schus to write it, he says her name is Chaya, so she's Vachayit Nalibe, and and the Rebbe speaks about Avis Yisrael in connection to visiting someone in the Nichum Avelim. When we go for a shiva call, especially someone by the name Chaya. So Chaya is a word the Rebbe used that she gives vitality, life. A life to Yiddishkeit. In the famous Sikha Chav Beishvat, Tov Shin Nun Beis, the Rebbe speaks Yisrael, about the name Chaya Mushkin. That Dira Betachtenim is the shlichus we all have to build a home for the divine in this world. Chaya Mushka adds that it should be a dira no, a beautiful home. One with a chayis, with a vitality. You can have a home that's also somewhat static, or worse. And mushka is a scent. It's one of the incense. Musket, like a perfume. Beautiful scent, which adds another dimension. So not just to build a home, to build a beautiful home. Though the Rebbe, I don't recall connecting it, but Basil Legani, not just a dira, a home, but a gani, a garden, as the Rebbe explained in the Shnas Hashivim, Yud Shvat, Tov Shalamet Beis. Gani is even more, it's a place of delight, a place of beauty, a place of pleasure. Clearly talking about the Rebbe Tzachai Mushka. Did we see that? I have no question, the Rebbe's home, from the day that he, they married, in Warsaw, in Tov Resh Pei in 1928, end of 28, Yudal Kislev. That was what the Rebbe Tzim brought in, the Malchus to the Zah. And definitely all the, over the years, of every place they lived, whether it was in Berlin or in France, and their journeys and travails, all the way coming to the United States in 1941, until that Chav So though the Rebbe was speaking as a directive to us, but it's very clear, he's talking about the Rebbe Tzim's name, so it's clear that the Rebbe Tzim achieved that. Making it no bringing in the beauty, the vitality, the beautiful aroma, both physically and spiritually and emotionally. So the Rebbe plays a role in our lives, the Rebbe plays a role in our lives, the Rebbe plays a role in our lives as a partner. As I said earlier, it could be a silent partner. It could be a Malchus Dika style. But today there's also directives that we honor, directives the Rebbe gave us. So I would refer you also to episodes 236 and 255 where I spoke more about this particular with the Rebetzin's role. What was it that the Rebetzin said to the Rebbe that convinced him to officially accept the Nisias? So this is, I only heard it here, say, I can't say I heard it from first source, someone who had heard it from the Rebetzin or from the Rebbe, but they say that in Tov Shin Yud, 1950, when there was that back and forth and the Rebbe refusing to formally accept the Nisias, the leadership, with all the explanations people give, or the fact that we don't have an explanation, however you want to understand it, what it was, we, we always heard that the Rebetzin told the Rebbe, what will be with all the work my father did, meaning the Friedrich Rebbe, if you don't continue. And that was the Makkah so to speak, that was like the bottom line that pushed the Rebbe to formally accept. Why the Rebbe didn't accept right away and he didn't understand that in Tav Yud, of course he understood it. Whatever the reasons are, I'm not going to analyze that now. But that's what they say that Rebetzin said. Now, when you analyze and you, and you, and you dissect that, it's a tremendous misidus nefesh. Because remember, the Rebbe was a private person. The Rebetzin was a private person. But the misidus nefesh, that the movement must go on, that there's a cause greater than our privacy, ready to sacrifice that privacy. 
And you could hear it even between the war lines when the Rebbe cries at the end of the Maimar Bos Lagani Tovshin Yud Aleph. When he says it's not without choice, not through our Veda, our work. And many come in Yonim in some ways, it's not even our, it's in the opposite of our will. Who's the Rebbe talking about? So I could assume that the Rebbetzin felt the same way. They were private. They chose to live not near the Friedrich Rebbe in Europe. They don't want to be part of that, whatever the reason again. But there's a cause, and the cause is greater than everything. Psidus Nefesh. So we don't know the official things. I don't know what was said exactly. I don't even know the accuracy of the story, and I'm not going to vouch. I just said what I heard. But I can I hardly imagine that the Rebbetzin did not, of course, was one, one, one agreement, total agreement with the Rebbe. Accepting the Nasius was not just an individual decision. And I'm confident that it was the dedication and the commitment to the cause, regardless of their own comfort zone, regardless of all the different challenges that it posed personally, family, and so on. If the Rebbe is telling the Rebbe that if he doesn't accept the role of leader, then it's disrespectful to the Friedrich Rebbe, and all his work was for nothing, I don't know if it was to that extent, but this is what the writer writes. Would it be fair to say that if we don't do our part to bring Mashiach, then, we're being dis- then we are being disrespectful to the Rebbe and all his work was for nothing? Those words are too strong for my, to come from my mouth. The Rebbe did say, that he said on himself. So I don't want to use the word nothing. That's not a good word. The word I would use is absolutely. The Rebbe gave us a job. That's not just speculation. The Rebbe said, I did everything, and just to the you do whatever you think you can. That's Chav Ches Nisan Nun Aleph, 91. A few years, four years earlier, Purim Mem Zayin, 1987, the Rebbe said it in different words. So this isn't just speculation. The Rebbe told us that we have to do, and it's dependent on us. Again, whether we like it or not. So absolutely. So the Rebbe sends words to the Rebbe's taka lesson to us. What is the lesson? That the cause must be fulfilled. There's a mission that we were given by the Rebbe. It's actually a mission given to us by God. And the Rebbe is the messenger from Hashem to tell us what our mission is. That mission is forever, until it's finished. So beginning of time, the Teda, the Ebrishter, God, gave us a mission. And no matter what happens, even if it's not the way we like it, even if it's not what we like, and there was in Tovshin Yud what happened in Tovshin Yud, and Tovshin Nundal what happened in Gimel Tammuz, and Chov Beishvat and Mem Ches, the job must be done. The journey continues. We must forge ahead. There is absolutely no, not even one iota of hesitation. Are we human beings and we may have doubts? We all humans. But we cannot let it affect the forward progress. Everything that was built is now in our hands to make sure it comes to fruition. And we were given the strength. That doesn't mean we're great people. It means we're given the strength and we're sitting on the shoulders, standing on the shoulders of giants and g- taking these directives and the Nesinus care that comes with these directives, the empowerment that comes with it to finish the job. So yes, that would be a very good lesson from the words of the Rebetzin, again, assuming that's what she had said. I only say assuming because I want to be 100%. I want a story. You want to be make sure there's a source. Who said it? First person. Do you hear from the Rebbe directly? Do you see it in a letter? You heard it from someone that it happened with. So that's why I'm being very precise in that matter. Because there are a lot of stories out there that are, find out later, they're not exactly going to happen that way. It could have happened differently. So there, but there are many stories and plenty enough that are substantiated and can be substantiated. That's why I'm being careful as in a, it's just a tangential uh, footnote. Okay. Stories about the Rebbets in the early years. Can you tell us some stories about the Rebbets, especially her early years before marrying the Rebbe? Thank you. Well, I appreciate your trust in me, but uh, I wasn't around then either. So any story I hear, heard is a story that I, any story that I will tell is a story I heard. I'll share one or two in honor of Chav Beishvat that I had heard I, I feel reliable. Um, and uh, I heard it from my father. Who heard it from the Rebbe? And in Tovshin Lamed Zayin was was fifty years from the from the Geula, the liberation of the Rebbe Friedrich Rebbe from prison. Yud Beis Thomas Pei Zayin Lamed Zayin, nineteen twenty seven, nineteen seventy seven. My father, publisher of the Algemeiner, um, wanted to make a special bylaga, a special supplement for that week, where he would have pictures and stories and uh, articles and analysis. So he asked the Rebbe. 
Of course, the Rebbe encouraged it. But he asked the Rebbe, since it's a special supplement of 50 years, would the Rebbe perhaps tell my father a story or two that is not known? What we call today Pirsam Rishon. Breaking news. Headline. Something new. New revelation. The Rebbe smiled and told my father, first speak to people who are around then. And he mentioned a few names, that Ebbetson, her sister, others that worked with the Friedrich Rebbe, the Rashag. And then come back to me, and I'll fill in after you hear from them. Okay, so that's what my father did, and he went to interview. And one of the people, he went to the Rebbe, the Rebbe Chaim Mushka was, of course, there. So two stories my father heard from her that he shared with me at the time. And I'll share it now in honor of Chav Beishvat. Story number one, and I'm not sure the context. One was about the Geula, and the other one just a story, which I'm not sure the context, but let me share it. The first story is that the night they came to arrest the Friedrich Rebbe, the Rebbe Tzachayim Mushke told my father the following, something that was not known till then. She said she was on, taking a walk with her chosen, the Rebbe. Remember, they were engaged, we're not sure exactly when, but it was several years till they got married. So when they got married in 1928 in the winter, Yudal Kislev, they were ready together as engaged a couple. Together meaning they were engaged. So they saw each other. So they were taking a walk, and the way that Ebbetson told my father was they were walking in Leningrad. This was in, in, in uh, Petersburg, Leningrad, with Friedrich Rebbe lived then. We're talking about 1927. And they walked, she said, there was a little short bridge not far from their home. They walked over the bridge. She said it was a beautiful night. And they walked on the bridge. They were walking home slowly. And they came home. The Rebbe, of course, walked her to the door. And he was waiting until she goes in. And then he would go back home, wherever he was staying. The Ebbetson walks in. She sees... The, the, the police, the NKVD, have arrived. She couldn't just go back out. So she went up to the second floor, and she opened the window, and she yells to the Rebbe, Mirhoben guest, we have guests. Which everyone in the Rebbe understood immediately what that meant. He ran then to Chaim Lieberman, the secretary of the Friedrich Rebbe, to notify him, and he had to hide papers, they had to destroy papers. You know, they didn't want anything that could be used as evidence, but of course there was no evidence but fabricated evidence of counter-revolutionary activity, the way the Bolsheviks, the communists, the, the, the Yevsekhtia, the Jewish department, which were the worst anti-Semites, would try to use against the Friedrich Kadeb. That's one story she told. So clearly, it's not a detail in the Yudbeis Thomas story. I'm not sure of the context of the second. The second thing, when she was a little girl, she said, so she had two sisters, older sister was Chana, younger sister Shana. They would, they, they, the Rebbe Rashab was their grandfather. The Rebbe Rashab would travel, um, and often he would travel with their father, the Friedrich Rebbe. And she said these words, the Tatis al Mugven Meshtereng, he was more, more uh, disciplined, more severe, I don't know if the right word severe, but he was a more, more, more uh, formal with them. The Zaydi given Asach Varam, it was a lot more giving and so on. Let me just explain. This is not in any negative way. It was I mean the Friedrich Rebbe was more serious. The Rebbe Rashab was more like a grandfather. He says, once they came back, and they brought gifts. The Rebbe Rashab brought gifts. He brought a watch, he said, for her sister. He gave me a gift. I don't think she said what the gift was. And she, in the house, was very excited. So she was running out to show her friends the gift. The Friedrich Rebbe was sitting in the outer chamber, the outer, like the outer room, which you had to go through in order to go outside. And the Friedrich Rebbe, so she didn't want to disturb her father, so she like tried to sneak out or like walk out very uh, discretion, discreetly walk out of the room and go outside to her friends. Uh, her father, of course, noticed, called her over. Mushke, or Musi, I'm not sure the way the Rebbe called her was Musi. Called her over and said, Vu to where are you going? So she said, she's going out, her errand. The Friedrich Rebbe said she's going to something else, so she, the, Rebbe, the Rebbe sat her down. I think she said in the lap, she was a young girl, or near her, and said, Friedrich Rebbe said to Musa, you should always know that the truth, the emes dafs nisht al mozog, about a ligan term you don't have to always say the truth, but a lie you should never say. She said it was a lesson for her for her entire life. Again, I don't know the context, and obviously a lie, she didn't say a lie, but it means to say, she said a little, she could have just said, I'm going to show my friends the toy. Or the, or the gift my grandfather gave me. And so you don't have to always say the truth. Now you don't have to call it, say everything that's going on in your life. There are things that are private and so on. But never say the lie. These are two stories I heard from my father and then in 1977. 
So I share it because my, many have not heard it. And it's just the Chivivusa de Milsa around Chav Bey Shvat. There are many other stories we have. There's stories in the Friedrich Rebbe Siches. There's a story about the question why you don't say Hallel on Shvir Shal Pesach. That's attributed to the Chaim Mushke. But I, uh, because of limited time, I just decided to share this. Another question. Can you please relate the story where someone asked the Rebbe for a bracha? And he replied, you can ask the Rebbe since she has the powers to give brachas too. Was the Rebbe implying that she has the power to give brachas because she is the partner? Or she has that power on her own merits? Also, is it considered disrespectful if someone visits the oil but doesn't also visit the Rebbe since Kevin? So this is a story that's going around. I heard it, I would say it's pretty reliable, where I think there were guests that had come to see the Rebetzin in her house. And uh, then, and one of the things they wanted, I, I'm, I'm not so accurate with the story, let me just share as I heard it. They wanted a bracha from the Rebbe. The Rebbe knew they had met, seen the Rebetzin. So he told her that, she could have said that they could have asked her a bracha because her bracha is exactly like he wrote. She can give a power, she can give brachas too. I had to analyze whether it's becoming from the Rebbe. Remember, she's also the daughter and the granddaughter and great-granddaughter all the way to the Alta Rebbe, the daughter of the Friedrich Rebbe. So I'm sure in her own schus as well. But additionally, also the schus of being the Rebbe, son of the Rebbe. I, the Rebbe didn't say that, but obviously all that goes to her, to her and she is a holy woman, had that power. Is it disrespectful? Uh, I, I mean, I, I don't know if there's a halacha about it, but I think it's a respectful thing to do if you're going. The Rebbe, always he went to the Friedrich Rebbe, he would then go over to see his mother's uh, gravesite, as we know from pictures and stories and so on. So I would think it's a decent thing to do, respectful as well, at least to, to acknowledge. You know, you're visiting, it's like visiting someone, you're saying hello to another. They're talking about the Rebetzin. So that my answer would be yes. But this brings me to another question, that, uh, to another story rather. This I heard from the Gabal Dover himself, Rabbi Yisif Tevel. Chavra Man Olva Sholem passed away far too young. And he told me the story that happened with him in, the, in one of the summers, I believe, in 1965 or 66. He was here in the summer. The Rebetzin would come visit her mother in 770 on the second floor. One day she pulled up and she has a bunch of bags. She had come shop, She went shopping. So Rabbi Tevel, he was a boy, he was a young boy, eight, nine years old. And he sees the Rebetzin carrying. So he went over, can I help? The Rebetzin said, yeah. She gave him a bag or two. As they get to the elevator, Elevator upstairs, upstairs in seven seven, where the Rebbe would give dollars to go up to the second floor. The no- Rebbe notices that Tevel has a cast. He broke in his arm. He had a cast. So the Rebbe said, "You don't have to be. You don't have to bother." But he insisted. They went up to the, they went up to the second floor. The Rebbe says, "Wait here." She takes the bags in. Then she comes back out, thanks him, and she has a big chocolate. Where he said that big chocolate, like coin chocolates, the ones you use for shalach manas for Purim. She gave it to. Him. He was a mechutzef. He said, I was a chutzpinyak, you know, a little audacious. He says to the Rebetzin, Ich kum von achsidische mishpache. Ef she weisnish the Rebetzin, maybe the Rebetzin doesn't know. Ich kum von achsidische mishpache. I come from a chsidic home. And they taught us that, that when you do a favor for a Jew, you don't take payment, especially for the Rebetzin. The Rebetzin gave a broad smile, the way he described a smile from ear to ear. And the Rebetzin said, Dach zach mir, as ich kum ich von achsidische mishpache. I presume they also come from a Hasidic home. Just as an aside, I mentioned she's the wife of a Rebbe, the daughter of a Rebbe, the granddaughter, all the way to the Alta Rebbe, and so on. So she says, I, pres- I assume that I presume I also come from a Hasidic family. I think. And as they taught, as Megitep is Nepman, Bufrat of Spitzala Guten Chocolate, that when you're given something, you take it, especially a good chocolate. So he took it, he shared it with his friends. Now, every story has deeper meaning. It right away brought to mind the story with her great-grandfather, Tzamek Tzedek. Great-great-grandfather, I should say. Tzamek Tzedek was once offered by the al a gift of learning Teir, of a certain amount of idea, of knowledge in Teir. And he rejected it. Because you got to Metzosi, you have to hard of it, you have to work yourself to receive Teir. Later he said he regretted it. Because Teir Aruch Meretz Midu Rechav Aminu Yam, Teir is Ein Sof, it has no limits. So whatever he would have received as a gift, he could have used his effort and diligence to study further. I'm a git lampman. When something is given to you, you take it. Which is, we're given many strengths in our generation by the Rebbe, by the Rebbe, and it's our responsibility is to use it to the fullest.
to do justice and gratitude and honor that which was given to us. Okay, can you tell us the story of the courtship between the Rebbe and Rebetzin that led to their marriage? Did they go on dates and then decide to get married, or was it a prearranged marriage by their parents? Okay, I don't, I don't have much about the courtship. I shared one story that I had heard from my father. Uh, we do know that the Rebbe Rashab had said that a daughter of the, one of his granddaughters would marry, should marry one of the children of Rabbi Levi Yitzchok, which is, of course, the Rebbe's father. That we do know. I believe it's even in writing, if I'm not mistaken. Um, but, of course, they met. The Rebbe came to Leningrad, and they met. We're not sure exactly when. Some say already in Pei He, which would be 1925. They got married in 1928. Maybe even earlier. The Rebbe came, I believe, in 1923, Pei Gimel. And um, we don't know much. I, at least, don't know much. But I will say this. If anyone does have some information, or something's written that I'm forgetting, please share it with me, and I will share it with the public. There's a large viewing public that listens to this program, thank God, and I'm honored by that, and this may be a good opportunity to just a few housekeeping announcements. So My Life, Chassid is Applied, we're now in episode 296. Where are the f- previous 295 episodes, you may wonder? They're in archives to be viewed at any time at your convenience at chassidusapplied.com, a relatively new website where it showcases all previous episodes. It has a form, a completely anonymous form where you can ask any question, all these questions come from that forum. If you want to write directly to me, you need to include your email there or some contact info because we cannot trace it. It's all anonymous. As well as other Hasidic resources, as the name Hasidus Applied implies. Applying Hasidus, Samachvav and Ayim Beis. There's the essays of the past five years of contests, hundreds and hundreds, thousands of essays that apply Hasidus as well. And a full array of other resources to please take advantage of that. Okay, then let's do a few more Chav Beishvat, since it's Chav Beishvat, then, then we'll, uh, we'll move it along here. Is, if this is an inappropriate question, then I apologize. Do we know what illness it was that caused the Rebetzin to pass away? I don't. And I frankly am not even, uh, never asked. There's a story, this we have, that when the Rebbe was sitting Shiva, so one of the Rebbe who came by, sat, came to the Shiva call, started probing and asking the Rebbe this question. Did she suffer? What did she suffer from? How long? How was it difficult? You could see the Rebbe was very uncomfortable. And finally the Rebbe said to him, and this concluded, <laughs> closed this chapter, said to him, the body, the soul and body separated in such a way that they could not bring them both back together again. To Parkinzich, to start digging what exactly, I don't know if it's respectful, I don't know why it's relevant. I'm not suggesting you, if you're really curious, you could probably do some research. If you're also not a young woman, so I'm sure there were different issues and challenges, but I, uh, even if I did know, I wouldn't discuss it. I don't think it's the right platform, not respectful. So I say what the Rebbe said, that the Neshama, the Ebishta chose that there's a Neshama, and one of the Sikhs the Rebbe says, a, f- a fire came from heaven and took a, a, a soul away from its body. And in a way that we could not bring it back together, which of course is the painful part. That's how the Rebbe describes it, so that's how I would describe it. Our challenge is how do we use Vachayit Nalibe, how do we learn the lesson? And the Rebbe, in that Sikha, when he says that Eish came, he says, Eish Tzorech La'afre. That for it to be a Malach and Shabbos, to light a fire, you have to need something. You can't just light a fire. That's not enough, Midar Isa. It has to leave some ash. And you want the ash, so then the Malach is Tzrich Lagufa. You need it for some purpose. So the Rebbe says, Afre would mean that the fire that consumed the soul is Tzorech Afre it will come back in the ash because the body, soul needs the body, Tchir Samesim, because the Tachlis HaKavonah, the ultimate purpose is to make a Dira B'Tachten. Okay. And may we merit that as soon as possible. The Rebbe after the Rebbe since passing. Did you notice a big change in the Rebbe after the Rebbe since passed away? Well, I already said that earlier. That absolutely. We definitely, we definitely saw a difference. 
Uh, first of all, the Rebbe moved the whole operation from 770 to his house. Starving for the Rebbe three times a day. The vachayit libi, the anguish that was recognizable. Very different than when the Rebbe's mother passed away. It was a very obvious. So we saw. Then there was the changes that actually changed. A lot of things changed. The fabrengans became much shorter. Not immediately, over the months. The Rebbe stopped speaking Rashi, Sichas, Zoyar, Pirkiovis, Rambam. My modem stopped. Again, in time. It's clearly connected. Why? I'm not going to explain. I have, no re- I have no idea why. But definitely there was a change. And I believe I explained earlier, Melech, Matronis, Malchus. So it had an effect. The Rebbe remains Rebbe. The mission remains there, Ashvi. And the Rebbe spoke about it. Chov Beishvat, the Tkufis from Yur Aleph Nisan. I'm sorry, from Yud, from Yud Shvat to Yud Aleph Shvat. Twice Yud Aleph Shvat is Chav Beishvat. Twice 11 is 22, connecting Yud Aleph Nisan. So clearly it's part of the whole process. And it had an effect. Yes, the answer is yes. Effect on his teachings, his attitude. It seems to me as a layman, this person continues, that after the Rebbe passed away, the Rebbe went into overdrive and started doing much more than he did before and with a bigger sense of urgency. You could say that. I don't know if I would put it quite that way, but you could say that. And you could say also that remember, the Rebbe had already established in Tov Shin Yur Aleph, 1951, that this is the Deir Ashvi. And it was already in the 80s that the Rebbe was talking very increased urgency about Moshiach coming, Ula, Purim Amzayim, for one example, before Chav Beishvat. So to me, it wasn't just Chav Beishvat, it was that we were coming, and maybe that was part of the process, that we're coming to the finish line. And that was the increased sense of urgency. One more question on this topic, and then we'll move. But we know a lot about two of the Friedrich Rebbe's daughters, but whatever happened to his third daughter that was married to Mendel Hornstein? So there was three daughters, Chana, Rebbe Tzachai Mushke, Chana married to Rashag, Shmayo Garari, the Rebbe Tzachai Mushke married to Kostin the Rebbe, and Shana was the third youngest sister. Now she unfortunately, tragically, with her husband Mendel Hornstein, were, uh, in, Kars- were uh, in a concentration camp, and they were gassed and killed there. As a matter of fact, there's a very moving um, introduction from the Rebbe to one of the Maimodim. Let me just find it. So I'll give you the actual page. Very, very sad. Um, in Tav Shin Yud Aleph, which is Maimodim the Rebbe continued to publish after, the, the, uh, after Yud Shvat, so the Rebbe printed one of the Kuntresim, he writes up, that about what happened in Treblinka, by that name. Just bear with me. I should have had it open before, but I didn't. Um, I don't see it right now. Okay. Well, in one of the contrasts, the Rebbe opens up with that story and says that he heard a person wrote to them, he saw he was an eyewitness, and saw what had happened. Oh, here it is. On page uh, 106, in Seif Mamorim Tav Shin Aleph, it's the beginning, the introduction of the Rebbe to the Kuntus of Shabbos Pasha Neyach. So he says, according to a letter from Marmordchai Unrad, who was in the Machna, who was in the concentration called Treblinka, that in 1942, in the barrack, he was together with Amendel Nachem Mendel Harenstein Hakoyen, And there was also his mother, whose name was Chaim Mushke, interestingly, and her husband. And the Rabbonis, the Rebbe Tzinech Shena. On the 15th of El, 1942, the Kapo brought to Rab Mendel a letter from, from his uh, wife. That on the 14th day of Elul, her mother was taken to the gas chambers. On the third day of Tishrei, Tovshin Gimel, 1943, the, the Kapo came and told them that the second day of Rosh Hashanah of that year, 43, will actually be 1942, I'm sorry, 1942, um, they, his wife was taken to the gas chambers. On the 25th of Cheshvan, 1942, when uh, Mordechai Undad returned from his work, he did not find a Mendel any longer in the barrack. And they said, and the people there said that he was taken as well with a group of Jews to the, to the chambers. It's all the Rebbe's own were writing, honoring her. I believe on the Rebbe's uh, 
Matseva, it also mentions her name because she never had a gravestone, tragically. So we should only talk about good news, but she was a third sister, yes, and a third daughter of the Friedrich Kareb. Okay, make a little hefsik. I want to talk about a few follow-ups. Uh, the questions that were asked after last week's program, after two weeks ago program. So one is about Pasha Yisrael. Yisrael advised Moshe about appointing leaders. In, this, in, in Pasha Yisrael, we notice that Moshe was being overburdened and overwhelmed with huge lines of people waiting to ask him questions. And, and Yisrael suggests appointing assistants, delegating to deal with easier questions, to give Moshe more time to deal with the more serious issues. An entire hierarchy was created. Sari Alofim, Sari Meis. So we were able to handle with many more questions. And Yisrael accepted, I'm sorry, Moshe accepted this suggestion. So someone writes now, has anyone ever dared make a similar suggestion to the Rebbe? Well, my friend, the Rebbe himself made this suggestion. Especially in the later years, in the, in the 80s, even before that, but especially then, the Rebbe is speaking many times about Asel Kharav. Appoint for yourself a mentor, a teacher, a rav, a mashpia. In the famous Sikhim at Shoy Shabbos Truma, Tov Memches, which came just right after Chav Beishvat that year, the Rebbe spoke that medical matters, you should go to a doctor. Personal matters, you should go to a mashpia, a rav. Questions in Aloha communities, everyone should have people to go to. The Rebbe once wrote to someone who said, who asked the Rebbe a question, he said to go to Yedid Mavim, Mavim, a friend that's an expert. So he said, I want the Rebbe's advice. So the Rebbe said, what do you mind that I answer through your Yedid Mavim, through the friend that's an expert? So this is not the Rebbe relinquishing his authority. It's giving the power to others to be able to serve as, as delegated by the Rebbe. So this is not the Rebbe is removing his responsibility. So the Rebbe himself took the Eitzah that Yusra gave Moshe Rabbeinu. Moshe still remained the Rebbe at the time. He didn't delegate that, the authority, the person who the Ebishter spoke to. But in wherever possible, to make the law easier, to be able to get more done, yes, he appointed. And today, 25 years from Gimel Thomas, that's exactly the case. We all need to find people who have that authority that the Rebbe himself said to go to. And sometimes we have to look at ourselves in that way as well. We have more koiches today, but it's koiches coming from the Rebbe. So the Yeshua's advice is not just for then, it's forever. It's the concept of delegation, knowing when to delegate, not to over-delegate, not to under-delegate. So much more can get done. Every shliach, every shlucha, every person who received from the Rebbe, in a way, has now the ability to be a mashpia and use the Rebbe's methodology and apply it to different situations. That's exactly what our mission and job is. Okay. Tu Bishvat was spoken about last week, so someone asks after that, why was the Rebbe against using the term Tu Bishvat? And why wasn't there more awareness of it? I never heard the Rebbe being against it. I, maybe there's something in writing I missed. If someone knows something, please let me know. The Rebbe did not use the expression Tu Bishvat. He used Chamisha Osu Bishvat. On a practical level, it may not be anything against it. It's just two sounds more of a slang. The Rebbe was not into slang. It's not a lotion from Chazal. Chazal, Chamisha Osir B'Shvat. The 15th day of Shvat. Rosh Hashanah Le'ilon, Le'ilon is. So the Rebbe used Tata language. If there's any way the Rebbe said not to, I would like to see that and of course share it. The reason, as I said, is Tata language. I think the same thing with Tuba Of, Chamisha Osir B'Av. Okay. What is the connection between Tu B'Shvat and eating boxer, carob, chruvim, the language of Hebrew? So it's Taka Minig, and that Minig is brought in, uh, in Hayyem Yem. I'm sorry, no, no, my mistake. I stand corrected. Not in Hayyem Yem. In Pashas Yisrei, Shabbos Pashas Yisrei, Tov Shinun Aleph, page 300, the Sefer HaSichas, the Rebbe brings the Minig. That's it. I have not seen a source for the actual minig. What I've seen written, different people have speculated. One, there the Rebbe in that Sikhi Yisraim quotes the story of Hanina ben Desa, who had, who eating carobs in a miraculous way. So he says, you see, it's connected to miracles. Some are connected to the Gemara Rosh Hashanah, Dav Tezvav, Ahmed Beis, where it talks about what are the implications of Tu Bishvat, the Chamish Rosh I should say. 
Because Chamesh Shalosah B'Shad is the cutoff point in a sense, it's the beginning of the new year. So if you're a farmer, when do you tithe? When you want to tithe? When, so after Tu B'Shvat, anything that begins to bud after the 15th of Shvat, so it belongs in the new year of your tithing responsibilities, of Maisel. If it's before the 15th of Shvat, it belongs to the past year's obligations. But then the Gemara says in that the Rosh Hashanah, what about, gives exceptions. What happens if it buds before, but it grows and it's harvested later? So there's two different circumstances. If it's harvested later in different stages, so it belongs later. It belongs, I'm sorry, to before. But if it's all harvested at once, and one of the examples given is carob, cheruvim, then it belongs to the year after Chamisha Asur Bishvat. And then it says the next year, the people accepted that, that was their minik. So someone connected, that's why the Gemara, it's a little allusion to the Gemara in Rosh Hashanah, so eat carob. Now it's true, Chamisha Asur Bishvat is about Rosh Hashanah, there's the seven different fruits, or, or, or tvua, growth, that grew in Eretz Yisrael, but the fact is the minig is to eat fruit in general. So carob is one of them. That's what I've seen. There may be more. If somebody has more to add, please share it with me. Okay. Since we're talking about customs, and again, these questions came in after last week's program, but it still relates, and I don't want to wait till next year, and it's relevant, so I decided I'll use this as a an addendum to last, chap- last week's uh, episode. Shabbos Shira was last week. Pasha B'Shalach. Why do we have a custom to eat buckwheat on Shabbos Shira? We eat kasha, buckwheat. So let me distinguish this. Eating buckwheat, there's also a custom at of Shabbos for children, the Maral did it and others, to give children to throw buckwheat to the birds, to the fowl. And the reason given for that is because by Kriya Syamsa, which is the week of Shira, when the par- sea parted, so it says trees miraculously grew. There were birds on the trees, and the children fed the birds kasha. That's what it says. So that's like a zeichel to that story with the maral in, uh, I believe, Sefer HaSichus Tov Shem Beis, Omet 73. The Rebbe brings in Lukut HaSichus Chelik Beis, volume 2, page 522. The maral would then bless the children. They should see merit to their children, bark and tater, marriage and good deeds. But the question here is about... Well, one more thing, the Mogan Avram in Shin Chav Dalad brings the custom to feed wheat to the birds on Shabbos Shira. But now we're talking about eating kasha, not feeding on Shabbos Shira. That's in Hayyem Yem, the 17th of Shvat. Some say the source of it is from a posik. Posik is in Tehillim Kuf, uh, Kuf Mem Zayin, I think you, uh, you Dalad. Posik is Hasom Gvul Echa Sholem, Chelu Chitim Yaz so the Pasuk says that God has made peace within your borders. He satisfied you with the finest of wheat. So since on Shabbos Shira, we read how the Jews were freed from Egypt. And they were being prepared to embrace the, the boundaries of Teda. It's customary to eat wheat based on that Pasuk. The El Lusafraim says that the word Beshalach is an acronym for Beshabbos Shira Lechel Chitim. Now, Shabbos to eat chitim, wheat. Okay, some of the sources. I have not found yet, and it could be the Rebbe does have an explanation what the meaning of Ruchnius is, the Chesidish meaning behind it all. What is the meaning of chitim? What is the meaning of Shabbos Shira? If anybody has any sources for that, please share that with me and I'll elaborate more. But that, let's suffice now with that. Okay, so there's plenty more to follow up. I want to do a follow up on a very sad thing. I really would like to avoid all the time, but I'm not going to avoid it now. And that is the issue of suicides. So I spoke about this in episode 293, and I've actually been, as I said, trying to stay away, but it's a reality that we need to talk about. So there was some follow-up where I spoke about the issue, tragic issue going on in our communities, what we can do. So I received a letter from my dear friend, Dr. Ellie Rosen, so he writes, Hello, Rabbi Jacobson, just listening to your piece on suicide, you do know that there's an organization called Neshamas. We do have a hotline open all the time. We are very concerned now working with this issue before the events of last week. That was when those two tragic deaths took place in Jerusalem. We will be presenting multiple workshops on February 23rd, I believe, on safe talk, essentially how to react when approached by someone who suggests that they are thinking of suicide. 
Chaz V'Shalom. Different workshops will be presented at different times. We are we're hoping to attract teens. We would appreciate your input in this sensitive matter as well as other issues. If you have the time, we, met, we meet at my house almost every Tuesday morning at 9.30 for an hour. Please join us. Eli Rosen and Shamas. I read it, even though I know it's an invitation to me and not to everyone, um, I read it because it's important. I want to acknowledge the great work that Shamas does with Dr. Rosen and others involved in this. I wanted the public to know it. So there, is, there are those that are reaching and developing programs and a hotline, anonymous, confidential. So let's all use those resources. Let's hope we don't need them. But should we ever need them, there are people there. And I'm sure there's more to be done. And my response publicly is, yes, I will do whatever I can to help with this cause. Koch Nefesh Mamsh. Another person wrote a rather long letter, which, um, you know what, I think I'm going to save that for another program because it's, it's, I want to do justice to it. I'll just do one more follow-up. In episode 291, 292, I spoke about rational Judaism and this Prager's rational Bible. So there was a back and forth. Some praised it, some criticized it. I tried to present a balanced approach. And here was one more note that I wanted to just follow up. Dennis Prager says the concept of chukim, which means super rational laws, does not exist in Torah and is an invention by our sages. See this video, fast forward to one hour, 56 minutes, three seconds, where he says that. There's no need to broadcast this comment. I just thought it's important for you to know what he teaches. Now, I, I chose to broadcast it because if indeed that's the case, we need to know. But this doesn't take away from good things. He's done. People have different views. Some are legitimate, some may not be. And I know it may be considered by some being insulting. I'm not trying to be insulting. If he said it, he's, I'm sure he stands by it. And we need to know it. But that doesn't take away from any of the great work and the great contributions that he's making because he's bringing many aspects of Taylor to many people. And we have to know, there's always, uh, there's always to know all the positives and also know that not, no, one is, no one is doing it always the perfect way necessarily. And we don't always agree with certain things, but that doesn't take away from the positives. Another question was um, about Pesum in episode 289. Hi, Rabbi Jacobson. Thank you for your weekly amazing podcast. I'm a teacher of teenage students. I watch these videos almost weekly, and many of these topics are shared with my students. May Hashem continue to bench you. I wanted to add something in reference to episode 289. Someone asked about why we focus so much on public menorah lighting, lightings for Pesum Anissa to publicize the miracle during Hanukkah, and, do, and don't do such things for Pesach, Rosh Hashanah, or other Yom Tevim holidays. In addition to what you shared there, I mean, you, you shared, there's a simple point to point out. The whole idea of Pesum Anissa, publicizing a miracle, is only mentioned in Gemara and Halacha regarding Hanukkah. There's no mention of such a concept by other holidays. The Rebbe explains a reason for this. So one can't compare Hanukkah to other holidays in regard to publicizing a miracle. One is discussed in Torah, one isn't. All the best. Okay, thank you. Um, the Rebbe's reason, yes, there are reasons, because Hanukkah is al Pesach Mesi Bachutz, the miracle of, that was connected to the outer world, not just an internal one, but really connected to others, and different explanations given for this. Now, there's more follow-ups to do. I just don't want to be backed up, so I'm trying to do as many as possible. I want to also honor the time and energy you spend in writing questions. So though if your question has not been addressed yet, it will be addressed it's just a matter of time. There's a big backup. And I'm trying to prioritize what is timely and so on and trying to squeeze in as much as possible. Let's move now to the Chassidus question of the week. The Chassidus question is a follow-up to last week. I spoke about the man. Pasha B'Shalach, we read about the man, the lechem in Hashemayim, the bread from heaven, that began to fall around 30 days after they left Egypt. So we spoke what the spiritual and Chassidic take on that is and what its purpose is. So in a follow-up, someone writes, what bracha did we make before eating man in the desert? So, interesting question, was a bracha made and what the bracha was? So there is. There's actually, the Rebbe has a maimer. Hinini mamtir. There's a maimer on Parsha B'Shalach that I am now, uh, mamtir is like raining down upon you the bread from heaven. Tovshin lamed zayin. So that maimer was said in 1977. In footnote 52, he addresses it, as well as in Lukut Sichas, which was adapted from that Maimon and Sichas, volume 16, page 176, footnote 29. And he brings from the Ramem Mipanoi, a great sage, a great Kabbalist, says that there was a bracha made, a 
that they made a blessing. We say, Amaitzi Lachem in Aretz, the one who draws bread out of the earth. They made the blessing to the one who draws bread out of the heaven. Or another Nusuch, which he doesn't mention. This is the Rameh, in Maimah Shabbosis Hashem, sec- section 2, in the beginning. And he says, the Asid Lava in the future will also make this Bracha Aman, which man, the man that was protected, was preserved in Sansenis in a jar for all time to remind us. Sefer Chsidim the Rebbe brings. Simon Tuf, 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 Mem, Tuf, Mem. That's four Tufs. That's 400 times four is 1640. He says, the Bracha they made this. Hanason Lechem in Hashemayim. Not Hamaitzi Lechem in Hashemayim, but Hanason Lechem, the one who gives and bestows bread from heaven. And it brings some Erachama in Zayar, on the Zayar that the Ramak interprets, Ramak Ramesh Kadavir interprets the Zayar that they made Birchas the Maitzi, a Maitzi. And after they finished, they made Birchas Hamaz and they benched on it. So, yes, there's a discussion on this topic, and the Maimer discusses more of the Chsidis of it that we discussed last week, that this is a gift from a higher place, from Primius Atik, Tala de Bedocha, the crystal dew. That comes from a place that's higher than Asusatata, higher than our efforts. This is something, a gift from above, to give us a taste of the divine reality that's higher and transcends existence. So in existence, we should have an experience of the transcendent beyond existence. We'll now go to the essays. So this is still essays from, 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 uh, epi- from uh, 2019, three essays. As I said, there's 10 more days for this 2020 essay contest. So take advantage of these 10 days, write great essays, make a creative or artistic presentation, go again to my life, sorry, chsidasupply.com slash contest for all the guidelines and detail and, uh, and, uh, and details. And please, follow those guidelines. I can tell you right now, essays would have won even monetary prizes had they followed the guidelines. Just follow once you finish it, show it to someone, and go through a checklist. Was everything in the guidelines achieved? Because that's how the judges, to keep an equal pl- a level playing field, need to have guidelines. And the guidelines they will use are the guidelines that you have. So it's so fair for everyone to be able to win. And everyone is capable of winning. Of course, writing the essay itself is the greatest win of all. So in last year's essays, going in the order of the way they, the marks they received. First one is a Hebrew essay, Hazula Suari. The other is a mirror. Chaye Giller, age 32, Lud, Lud Israel. Ganenis, she runs a Ganenis, a, uh, a school, a, garden, a kindergarten for autistic children, and is also a presenter for uh, parents. Very nice. So she writes about the other being a mirror. And I, would, I, I am looking, I'm sure her work has informed a lot of what she's written here, about how our environment affects us. And of course, based on the Balsham Tov's that when you see something in another, it's a reflection of who you are. It's meant to bring it out to you. So everything you see in here is a lesson. The other is a mirror. And that is the greatest educator and greatest teacher. And how much impact, the fact that we are social creatures, we're social be- beings, how the effect of others on us in a very profound way. And then concludes with eight lessons. How the other can help us in growing, in the mirror image metaphor or example. Okay, well done, essay. Second essay, How do we educate in the holy areas? How do we educate uh, a, 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 a holy education when faced with all the challenges of the world today? This is by Elio Shwika, H32, Tel Aviv, Israel, Shliach, in the neighborhood Hagusha Godel Bet Tel Aviv, in the largest um, center in Tel Aviv, okay, begins with a story about his own experience in education and the challenge of finding meaning and uh, purpose and direction in the chal- in the challenging world in which we live with all the different distractions. That's the gist of it, and he give, gives guidelines in a very interesting very much woven in with his own personal experiences from different sources, how one achieves that. Uses the karbonas, the offerings of the Mishkan and the Migdash as a metaphor, as an example of how we 
bring our offerings today in, in living up to our calling in this world and with a very nice conclusion as well um, that we all have a purpose in our lives we understand the importance of repeating something of, con of creating routines healthy and, and uh, good routines the importance of every action and everything should be done with great passion Okay, the final essay for today will be Living with Passion by Sterner Sarah Shiner, age 18, Montreal, Canada, a student at Montreal High, Montreal High, Base Rifka. Yeah. Apathy, she begins. Most people have had the experience of hearing someone passionately champion a cause and thinking, he's so into it, I'm not. Where does this excitement come from? It goes on to say that we will, um, in this essay, we'll review how one can develop such passion and uh, counter apathy in our personal lives. Explaining that this doesn't come from nowhere, from thin air. It's a, it's a process of cultivation and development. Using Tanya, the different ways Tanya describes how thought and emotion work, his bonus contemplation, and then practical aspects of learning, prayer, emotional connection versus disconnect. And then with a summary of how one builds up passion in life and that it can permeate every aspect of what you do. Another well done essay. Thank you. All these essays can be read at chassidahsupply.com, this essay section. And with this, we will now conclude this episode 296 of My Life Chassidah Supplied. We're here every Sunday. 8 to 9 p.m. Please submit your questions, your comments, your feedback, anything at chassidahsupply.com. There's a forum there. As well as take advantage, as I mentioned, of all the array, the wide array of resources. May we do our job in this seven, the beginning of the 70th year, 70 years of the Rebbe's leadership, to finally bin, finish the work. Finish the work in this stage, and we can march into the Gula Mitis Vashlema with the Rebbe, with the Rebetzin, give them the nachas they deserve after the investments that they made, the Mesir Snefers that they made. So this Chav Be'i Shvat, following Yud Shvat, double Yud, uh, Yud Aleph, twice is Chav Be'i 22, B'cho Yivorech Yisrael, should be baruchas to each one of us in a revealed way in every aspect of our lives, and all in the best of health, and we should be to fulfill this mission of Yifutza Mayin Asecha Chutza, and then Mashiach Osimar Domalka Mashiach. Thank you very much. This program is brought to you by My Life, Hasidus Applied. Please help us continue our programs. Make even a small contribution at hasidusapplied.com slash donate.